So here we go, recording begins. So official hello. Uh, my name is Shirin Katerson Kosropour. I am a director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Austin Community College. I'm also a professor of psychology at ACC. On behalf of Dr. Karen Grumberg, director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, and our own Austin Community College's Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. I welcome you to our new collaborative series, Poetry of Conflict and Transformation. It's a companion series to our center's um, Cinema of Conflict and Transformation, so I hope many of you will join us there as well. Our goal with this series is to bring faculty from Austin Community College in Peace and Conflict Studies into conversation with faculty from University of Texas in Middle Eastern literature to explore poems that are originally written in Arabic, Hebrew, Persian, and Turkish. Poetry will open the door for us to consider and discuss all the layers of conflict, from intrapersonal conflict, interpersonal conflict, and um, social, cultural, and political. So often, language can seem flimsy and inadequate in the face of violence and conflict, but poetry as an art form can help unlock ways to understand our own emotions and also make it easier to empathize with others' experiences. Poetry is actually used in conflict mediation work, and it's particularly powerful in reconciliation between communities um, between communities. For example, Irish poet and conflict mediator Padraig Otuma has used poetry in his conflict mediation work in Ireland to bring communities that have been in violent conflict with each other for decades together for reconciliation. So with this series, our goal is to better understand complex issues that poets in these regions have explored. I also think it's such a nice break to slow down from our usual quick reading and harried um, use of language and to um, really appreciate the beauty of these languages and the rhythms that languages bring to us. Um, each event begins with a presentation by a scholar in the um, relevant literature to contextualize the work. And then we engage in conversation and hope that the audience will join us as well. Today's event is particularly close to my heart as I feel like all of my worlds and identities are coming together in this um, event. Um, that's evidenced by a dream I had last night where I was using my samovar to connect to the internet. Um, I'm delighted, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was also running late in my dream, which is very appropriate culturally. Um, I'm delighted to have with us today uh, to have this conversation, Dr. Levi Thompson. Levi Thompson is assistant professor of Persian and Arabic literature in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. His research focuses on modernist literary developments outside of Europe. Levi's first book, Reorienting Modernism in Arabic and Persian Poetry, was published last year by Cambridge University Press 2022. I want to welcome Levi and ask him to um, tell you a little bit about his, um, particularly his educational path. I love for our students to hear all the different ways that we end up taking to be here. Um, so Levi, turning thanks it over to you. Much, thanks, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Austin Community College for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, I suppose I'm somewhat out of my comfort zone because I come at Persian poetry and literature generally from the perspective of someone who was initially an Arabist. So uh, I suppose I'll answer your question by talking about how I got there <laughs> because um, I, uh, I have a fairly traditional path through higher education to end up being a tenure track professor, but I come from the basically the boonies in uh, the middle of the Appalachian Mountains in Virginia, very far southwest Virginia near Tennessee, really small town of about 6,000 people or so. Uh, I didn't study Arabic in high school or anything like that. Uh, I did have 
some best friends who were uh, second generation Lebanese. Uh, they didn't speak Arabic or anything, <laughs> but I knew Arabic existed at least. But uh, when I was studying in high school, my language exposure was basically limited to Latin. And I did five years of Latin when I was in high school and decided when I got to undergrad, I went to William & Mary being from Virginia. A lot of people don't know that William & Mary is actually a state school. It's not a private school. So uh, it's not that expensive to get there if you live in Virginia. Um, it, it's a really great school. This is why some people are uh, uh, under the impression that it is a private school, but it's a public school in Virginia. Um, I got there and I debated continuing Latin, but I decided against it. And instead, I forget exactly what happened. A friend may have dared me to take Arabic or uh, I, I might have been thinking like, oh, uh, I'll just uh, register for Arabic and see what happens. But I, I took a year of Arabic and I found it easy compared to Latin. <laughs> so, uh, most people uh, don't have that experience when they take Arabic. They find it quite hard. It is a difficult language for English speakers to learn, but I enjoyed that first year um, and continued on. It wasn't a major of mine because um, that major wasn't offered at William & Mary at the time. Maybe a change now, because this was more than uh, 20 years ago at this point. But um, I majored in history and government, political science for anyone who doesn't go to William & Mary or UT. Strangely enough, they also call political science government at UT. So I'm now again at an institution that does something like that. Uh, but my, my real interest was in Middle Eastern studies and Arabic. So once I got my BA, I, can, I realized that I didn't really know Arabic well enough to get along with it. And I continued doing a master's in Arabic at the University of Pennsylvania, Arabic and Islamic studies. So there I opened up um, to the pre-modern tradition, did seminars in Islamic law, readings, uh, seminar style, going around the table, reading and translating Arabic. Um, into English uh, in a circle of uh, graduate students with one professor for hours and hours and hours um, working with pre-modern texts. And at the same time, um, we were encouraged to take a second Near Eastern language. So I started Persian at that point um, and I took two years of Persian during my master's and following that, I taught history for a year um, as an adjunct professor. So I've been in the trenches as an adjunct uh, for a year while I put together PhD applications and an application to the Center for Arabic Study Abroad, which at the time operated in Damascus, Syria and Cairo, Egypt. I uh, was accepted to CASA and uh, PhD programs at the same time. Um, and I ended up in the Cairo cohort from, uh, it was the 2010-2011 cohort. So I was in Cairo when the Arab Spring happened and uh, that was a very exciting time to be there um, attempting to learn Arabic. Our classes were not held for something like two months. There was a lot of delay <laughs> because of all the upheaval. Um, and during that time, Myself and some friends I had made in Cairo started a translation and archiving initiative called Tapper Documents. I will write it for folks here. Um, with which we collected paper ephemera from revolutionaries in Tahrir Square, which was the center of the revolution in Cairo, uh, translated them into English. Most of that material was in Arabic. Uh, and made PDFs of the originals and put all that online. So that was a really cool project to be involved in. Um, it got me thinking very seriously about uh, translation in different ways that weren't necessarily academic. I had done translation seminars uh, at Penn, including with Roger Allen, a very um, well-known scholar of uh, Arabic literature, but um, this was a whole new direction. 
uh, as far as translation goes. And it was a really good experience to do while I was at the Center for Arabic Study Abroad. Following that, I came back to the States and started a PhD uh, in Arabic literature at UCLA. Um, likewise, a really great experience. And because I was in LA and I had a little bit of experience with Persian, I decided to make that my real second focus for a, a language to work in while I was writing the PhD and doing my research. So I took several more years of Persian and did graduate seminars in Persian at UCLA, which is a great place to do that because you have a million Persian speakers around you in Southern California. So that was a really good uh, experience for me, very formative. And I was really happy to be able to add Persian to what I had done with Arabic so far. And uh, thank you for mentioning uh, the book I wrote, uh, which came out at the end of 2022. So I feel like it's really very fresh. <laughs> it, it was December that it came out. So just a couple months ago. And um, in that book and in my teaching, I do incorporate a lot of Persian material. So I have some more familiarity with Persian than folks who just focus solely on one language. I try to work across the two. And that is what led me to suggest Furu Farozad for today's discussion, because uh, we've already had um, an Arabic poet. Uh, we talked about Tamim al barhuthi with Afghan al Noy. So um, I think it's good to bring Persian in now, especially since Iran is in the news and folks are interested in what's happening in Iran. And because of all that, I, I thought that maybe Furugh and most specifically this poem, uh, Oh Bejeweled Land, would be a good option because it deals with the poetic persona's position within Iranian society and in relation to the state. So I think that's an interesting starting point for us. And um, Shirin, how will we approach things now? Should I go into my contextualization of everything or should we have a break what what do you think i don't know if we need a break okay um, yeah I, yeah it's our, uh, our it's totally up to questions. you and like it uh, i should mention i suppose if anyone wants to stop me we have loads of time today so feel free to ask me questions at any point i think if you raise your digital hand your name pops up to the top of the mm -hmm. participants list but once I share my screen, I might not see that. So please flag me down. <laughs> I will. I'll keep an eye. And okay. also those of you who are not able to ask using audio, um, if you feel free to ask, put your questions in chat. Yeah, and, um, I'll, I'll try to monitor yeah. that. Well, well, I'll keep an eye on that for us too. I'm going to bring the chat up here. Forgive me as I organize things. Um, so I made a few slides for us uh to get started here and now i just see my screen so i don't see all your lovely faces uh so do please stop me uh if if anyone's got any questions here i this shouldn't take too long i think maybe 15 minutes of setting things up and then we'll go into the poem and i'll put the slides aside so we can have more of a conversation and also shireen is going to help me out to uh, we'll read a little bit of the persian uh, and then I'll read from the English and then we'll go through the poem and see all the cool stuff that's in here um, that has to do with not just uh, politics in Iran under the Shah, but the entire history of, of Persian poetry comes in here as well. So that's interesting. Um, so, Furul uh, Farahzad's O Bejeweled Land, this is the poem we're talking about, and I'm going to get to what uh, point of her career this poem comes from and where it fits in overall uh, with her. So there we go. Okay. Um, Farouk uh, lived a short life because tragically she died in 1967 um, in a car accident. So uh, she was not, um, she was 32 at the time. Uh, she, uh, it, had she lived longer, she would have almost certainly had a major impact on the direction of modern Persian poetry, modernist Persian poetry, to be specific, um, because even with this short span of time that she was alive and writing, uh, her poetry really made its mark. So uh, despite her short life, she's really very important in 
the contemporary history of Persian poetry. Uh, most people who know a little bit about Furo are aware of the story of her early uh, marriage to uh, cousin Pardiz Shapur, which did not last very long. Um, they had one son together, uh, his name was Kamyar, uh, who after she and Parviz separated, um, she lost custody of uh, this son. And this is something that stuck with her for the rest of her life um, and influenced the way she went about many things. She ends up adopting another son uh, after making a very famous film called uh, The House is Black. Uh, which also left a very strong impression within the history of Iranian cinema. Um, this second boy, uh, who she was a mother to, his name was Hossein. He was the child of a couple who was living in a leper colony. And that's what this film is about. It's, it's an ethnography of um, this leper colony in, um, it's outside Tabriz in, uh, Northwestern Iran, um, who went there in 1962 and made this documentary. Uh, she got to that point because of the relationship that had developed between her and a very famous Iranian film director and producer Ibrahim Golestan, who uh, I believe is uh, still alive today. He was born in 1922. So I think he's 100 or 101 now. Uh, he lives in England uh, today. Uh, Furo had met him in 1959. Uh, she was working as a typist or something like that initially at his film studio, but they developed a relationship, uh, an affair, a romantic affair. Um, and um, through that relationship, she entered into the world of filmmaking in uh, and Iranian cinema and the house is black is the only representation of that that we have. Surely had she lived longer, we would have more film work from Furog as well. And uh, if I go back to the previous slide, you'll see this image that the New York Times used um, in a late obituary, obituary for Furog uh, was actually taken by Ibrahim Golasan as well. So. Uh, he was a very important asset of her life. Uh, moving now to her poetry. Uh, I have all of her published collections listed here with another birth from 1964 highlighted because the poem we're gonna talk about today comes from this collection. So I, I wanna highlight that for you all. Um, she has five uh, collections total. Uh, four of which were published during her lifetime. The first, The Prisoner, 1955, then The Wall, 1956, Rebellion, 1958, so very productive during the 1950s. Another birth, uh, which represents a, a shift in her approach to poetry, um, maybe I'm being too simple, suggesting that there's a split between the earlier collections and this one, but um, many critics see this as a real turning point for her uh, and a real marker of her entry into the discourse about modernist poetry. Um, I'm just checking the chat here. I see a message. Oh, I, I think that maybe is not a question for me. Um, her final collection, Let Us Believe in the Beginning of the Cold Season, it's my favorite collection. Uh, the poem that I deal with at length in my book is from this collection. It's the title poem of this collection was published posthumously in 1974. Again, she died in 1967. And in the way I look at the development of modernist poetry in Persian, I see Farah Saad's death as one marker of a possible end to, to the, the high modernism that developed within Persian. So uh, Furul, very important. And we're gonna look at a poem from Another Birth in 1964. 
some historical context here. Now, I'm not a historian of modern Iran, so this is basically information I have learned by osmosis over time. Uh, but we need to know a little bit about um, what was going on politically in order to understand this poem, which is highly political in nature. Um, so we're talking about Pahlavi Iran, uh, a dynasty that was in power from 1925 until the Islamic Revolution in 1979. I have the two Pahlavi Shah's names there at the bottom of this slide. We have Reza Shah, first of all, uh, who ruled from 1925 until he was forced to abdicate in 1941 by the uh, allies um, due to military politics of World War II. His son then takes the throne, Mohammad Reza Shah. Uh, many of you have probably, you, you probably know this Shah. Uh, he has been in cultural discourse within the US as well. Um, we know his face, we know what he looks like uh, in many cases. So uh, when Mohammad Reza Pahlavi takes power, uh, he seeks to institute a wide ranging project of rapid modernization that was called the White Revolution. Uh, that's a translation of the Persian, um, which lasted for most of his reign. We see one aspect of this revolution in the poem with this uh, need to register oneself and get a national identity card. Now, this is something that had existed before Mohammad Reza Shah. But uh, Florov is using it to undertake a critique of this rapid, mo rapid modernization program. And she starts off the poem with this. So it, it, the entire poem fits within this part of Iranian history. Uh, the White Revolution amounted to major change within Iranian society for many, many people. But at the same time, uh, even though the Shah was using a language of equality, justice, liberalism, things like this, um, the economic situation of the majority of the Iranians during this time did not improve. In fact, in many cases, it got worse, which led to the Islamic Revolution uh, at the end of the 1970s. That was a huge disaffection with the Shah's rule. Um, the the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was able to step in at this point um, and uh, bring the masses into a huge popular movement to get the Shah out of power, which in the end succeeded. And we know that history now because this is the immediate history of the Iran we know today as the Islamic Republic. So th this is just a very basic historical context. Um, I'll, be happy to try and expand on any questions folks might have about this, but uh, this is what we're talking about as far as the situation within which Furu Farafzad was composing her poetry. So it's all situated within Ahlavi, Iran. Uh, the poetic context, and this is really where my expertise does come in, uh, we are looking at the advanced development of Persian poetic modernism a movement that we, we could trace back into the 19th century if we really wanted to look at the roots of it, but most critics, uh, myself included, look to one figure in particular as the progenitor of this movement, a man named Nima Yushij. It's a pen name for uh, a guy whose name was actually Ali Isfandi, Isfandiari, uh, who between the 1920s and 1930s starts to chip away at some received ideas about what a poem should look like and begins experimenting with new forms, moving rhymes around uh, in the poem, changing where the poetic feet stop and start. I, there's a lot of background here to understand how the form of Persian poetry works. There are some connections with Arabic here too as well. Um, I spent a lot of time in the book I wrote talking about those connections. I won't go into them today because they're really very intricate and don't carry over into English very well. Uh, it's enough to know that Nima's step forward in the tradition of Persian poetry is to start changing 
some forms that had basically been the standard for around a thousand years. Within Persian, this type of poetry was referred to as shereno, uh, new poetry, sometimes translated as free verse, which is not a very good translation because it doesn't entirely do away with rhyme and meter. Meter is still present within this poetry. So English free verse, which does do away with those two things is not a good equivalent, but because we don't have the language for it, critics frequently use free verse to uh, explain what this poetry is. We find the same thing with Arabic, uh, the Arab modernists call their new poetry, the Shir al-Hur, which literally translates to free verse. Unfortunately, it's not free at all. <laughs> That's the translation that we have. So Furu Farouzad uh, is a later iteration of this tradition. He comes in after it has been somewhat established and to my mind takes the changes that Nima introduces to the tradition to the furthest points they can go without becoming prose poetry, uh, uh, a, a true free verse that has done away with rhyme and meter entirely and is more like what we understand with European free verse. Farahzad remains connected to this thousand year tradition, but she really experiments with things formally uh, to say nothing of the Oh, I have entered the waiting room. You have a doppelganger or something? I suppose I did. Oh. <laughs> Everyone can still hear me fine? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, and it went away. Um, okay, so that was strange. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so that this is on the formal side of things. Uh, Farouk really uh, is engaged with this history of poetic modernism within Persian. She's also interested in the European modernists by the end of her life. She's studying English. She is attempting to read, for instance, T.S. Eliot, who seems to have had quite a bit of influence on her, particularly in that last collection from 1974 published after her death. But on the other hand, and here we're getting to the critical reaction to Farouk, she introduces a feminine perspective with her poetic persona. And this is something that is found very rarely, if ever, in Persian poetry until Furu uh, starts writing. Um, there are women poets that predate her, but uh, her willingness to ascribe a feminine perspective to her poetic persona throughout her work really stands out. And the critical reaction to this was, maybe this is to be expected, highly misogynist, uh, dismissive, um, and unappreciative of the advances that Furu was making with poetic language in Persian. Uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this too if folks have questions, um, but I, I think I'll move ahead for now. Um, the book I have here is, this is Tavaladi Dige, the, uh, fourth collection from which the poem we're reading today comes, Another Birth. Um, I will mention this concept, this idea of another birth, links Furu's poetry up with trends in modernism as a global or planetary movement where myths of death and rebirth are really central to uh, the entire movement. If anyone knows any modernist poem, it is probably The Wasteland, by T.S. Eliot from 1922, which if you've read that poem, you know, is completely driven by this idea of uh, dying and coming back to life, the cycling of death and rebirth. And where does T.S. Eliot get this idea from? Near Eastern myth, which he has gotten to through his readings of, yes, Sanskrit uh, while he was at Harvard just a little bit, but more so, a book called The Golden Bow by James Frazier, uh, which comes from the end of the 19th century. It's a, a critical approach to 
myth and folklore across different cultures with a lot of focus on the Near East. So T.S. Eliot uh, comes to the themes of his modernist poetry by engaging with the Near East. And in the book I wrote, I make a lot of hay out of that. Um, Florol is doing the same thing here and we see it in the title of this book. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so I, I have brought for us today a short clip from a somewhat recent film, a 2014 film, Golisor by Sebideh Farsi, uh, film director, uh, Iranian film director. Uh, and I bring this because I intend to show how central Furul's poetry has remained within Iranian culture, both inside Iran where her poetry has been censored and banned uh, in turn uh, since the Islamic revolution. There's been lots of debates over uh, that within Iran, but then also for Farah Saad remains incredibly important in the Iranian diaspora too. And uh, this film really highlights this for us in a, a scene that I'll show you now. Hopefully the sound will work nicely for us. Let me bring it up here. So uh, allow me to situate this because I'm just going to give you two minutes of an hour and a half long movie. Um, this film is about the 2009 protests that took place in Iran. Uh, we call them the Green Revolution. Uh, these were largely driven by young people who were protesting uh, the, the counting of votes in the presidential election between Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, whose name you probably are familiar with, and his opponent, Mir Hossein Mosavi, um, who the revolutionaries were in support of. The film, Red Rose, opens with a group of these young people who are being chased by uh, security forces in the streets, and they take refuge in this middle-aged man's house, uh, this man that you see here uh, on the YouTube video, I can make this full screen. Um, his name is Ali. One of the protesters, the young protesters, um, accidentally on purpose, we don't know for sure, leaves her phone at his apartment and comes back to get the phone. So she's going to ring the doorbell and then come up into his apartment. The film, which we're not gonna watch anywhere near all of, uh, follows the relationship that develops between these two people, the younger revolutionary woman and this middle-aged man who uh, the film seems to suggest was involved with, uh, he was involved with leftist groups during the protests that ultimately led to the Islamic revolution. So that there were uh, uh, tacit bruises between the Islamist groups and the leftists, the communists, the socialists at the time. So the, the political involvements of people were very complicated initially. Um, and of course, we know how things ended up uh, after the Islamic revolution. So um, in this scene, you're going to see Furu Farazad pop up and I, I won't mention how exactly, uh, but we will talk about it a little bit after we watch. So let me know, uh, someone jump in if the sound isn't working well and I'll, I'll fix that. So in case it's not clear, this is Furu Farahzad's poster hanging on the wall behind the woman here. So I just want you to see now how Sebide Farsi sets up the shot uh, and how the main character and Ali, uh, the other main character, are uh, juxtaposed in front of this poster. It's really, uh, I think, quite telling about Furu's place in contemporary Iran. <laughs> Hey, man. 
باز هم اینقدر اگه ممکنه مرسی خیلی من بس آرام گفتم شوه بخواییم بدونی این از کجا بایدین تر راهش بمیدن از دوستامه میشتسینش دوزش داری؟ اینو نه فروغو با این بیشتر رو میکن ببخش من یه سیگار میتونم بکشم دوزش عذیت رو نمکنه بفهم شما میکشین؟ من نه من ترکیم خوش باید من که هر بار میام ترک کنم یه دوباره شروع میکنم شما آتیش داری؟ از اون کشی یه از جا میرین؟ اگه فرق میکنه اگه جون فرقش یه نمیدین؟ اینجا خوب بزرگه با شاید من خوب باشن تو کارتا شلو خوب که یه نویسنده یه روسه شب میده خب so uh, let me uh, get out of this you can see how central the image of Farouk there is uh, in this scene and um, they, the actors even comment on it being there who is she oh that's Farouk Farouk Zad uh, and I should mention too that um, the, the actors names uh, give them their due so uh, in the role of Sara uh, the young woman we have Mina Kavani and then as Ali it's Vasilis uh, Kukalani um, so uh, this film I think shows us for today how important Farouk remains within political and social discourse inside Iran and I thought perhaps at this point uh, maybe Shirin I, I could ask you to share some of what we talked about as far as your own relationship with Farouk and her poetry both within Iran and outside Iran um, because she casts such a long shadow and you have a personal relationship with her as well so maybe I could hand it over to you for a couple minutes to share with us yeah, thanks. I think I'm not unique among um, Iranians to have this relationship with Farooq. When I left Iran, I didn't, I, I didn't come to be an immigrant. I thought I was just coming for a couple of months until things settled down in Iran. Just around the time the, you know, things were getting really rough in um, late 1978. But what I did bring with myself is this copy of. Tavalodi to get another birth that I've had since I was um, a young teenager. Um, it's the sixth printing of it. Uh, the poems were written around the time I was born. So my copy is the sixth printing. And I have read it over the years. Um, even though I haven't had much time for literature in Persian, this is one that I have returned to over and over again. So it is falling apart. Um, when, you know, I think we were in a way um, lucky to have single sex education. I, they still do in Iran because um, her poems, at least in my school in Tabriz, which is a more conservative city, it's a big city, but it's a conservative city. Her poems were not banned. Um, it wasn't part of the teaching curriculum, but in our literature class, um, I think we had literature two or three times a week. Um, one day I asked if I could go read. I mean, Iran is a very, uh, has a big culture of, around poetry. So asking to go sit in front of the class, stand in front of the class and read a poem is not unusual. Um, but I asked my teacher if I could go read a poem and I read one of Furuk's poems and she was familiar with with her work and she asked me to make it a habit that every week to take a poem of hers to class and read it now her poetry is has not just sensuality but sexuality in it um 
So if we were not in a in single sex education, I don't know. I mean, in Iran for sure, but you know, this is like the 1970s. Who would have been allowed to do that? Um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want me to say? No, that's excellent. And I, I um, so I, I just have uh, one more slide uh, that I was going to use as we move into the reading of the poem. So I'll bring it up. Um, there we go. And uh, Shireen, if I can call on you again, uh, maybe you could read the first section of the poem uh, to give us just a taste of what it sounds like in Persian. And then I, I don't know if everyone had time to look at either of the translations. I sent two. Uh, so we have two translations. I'll read the same section from the English translations, and then we'll move through a few things in the poem that stand out to me. Uh, and then maybe we can have more of a discussion if there are questions and things like that at that point. So uh, I'll hand it back to you, Shuri. Okay, sounds good. Lines. Yeah. Fateh shadam, khod ra be saf resandam. Khod ra be nami dar yek shanasname mazayyan kardam. Be hastiyam be yek shomare mashakhas shod. Pas zende baad 678, sadere az bakhsh panj, sakin Tehran. دیگر خیالم از همه سو راحت است. آغوش مهربان مام وطن، پستانک سوابق پر افتخار تاریخی، لالایی تمدن و فرهنگ و جقجق جقجقه قانون. آه دیگر خیالم از همه سو راحت است. از فرط شادمانی رفتم کنار پنجره با اشتیاق 678 بار هوا را که از اقبار پهن و بوی خاک رو به ادرار منقبض شده بود درون سینه فرو دادم و زیر 678 قبض بدهکاری و روی 678 تقاضای کار نوشتم فروغ فرخ ساز به به مرسی شکریو so I, I, uh, I asked Shireen to read up to the point in the poem where فروغ inscribes her own name within the verse, because uh, this is a really interesting thing that she does here. Now, it's not the end of the poem, but there's a tradition, pre-modern po Persian poetry, for the poet to put their name or their, their lachab, uh, something that they're referred to by within the poem. Farooq's doing this, but in a very funny way, <laughs> not, not in the traditional way someone would do that, uh, but because she has finally like found an identity, a modern identity by getting an ID card. Uh, and before that, it's as if you don't exist. I think probably all of us, maybe just many of us, probably all of us have had similar experiences where you need some sort of document to show that you exist. And if you don't have them or some collection of them, you can't live your life like, here in Texas, I'm new to Texas as of a year and a half ago, going to the public safety office, not the DMV, to get a driver's license. <laughs> it's one of these experiences. You have to bring all sorts of documents. Is your car registered? Do you have the paperwork? Do you have a number? You're just a number in this modern world. So Furuh gets at a general experience that we all have, which is part of the reason why she remains, I think, so interesting and important, even as a global poet, not just within Iran, uh, but she says things particular to the 1960s Iranian experience, the 1960s Iranian experience of being a woman within this society as well. Um, so I'm gonna read from both the translations to that point where Farooq's name comes up because it will give me an interesting starting point to look at the contrast between the two translations, the first of which is by a professor of English at Pahlavi University. Uh, so this is an institution that was sponsored by the Pahlavis themselves. Um, obviously, the, the, the 
this institution exists still, but not with the same backing or support that it did. Uh, so this is coming from very close to when Farouk Barakzad was alive. The second translation by Shtoli Volpe uh, is much more contemporary. It's uh, post 2000, I think sometime in the 2000s she did it. And there are a few interesting things that we should take note of here. So this is Masoud Faizan's uh, O Bejeweled Land. Finally, I made it. I registered myself and confirmed my existence with a name and a number. Therefore, long live number 678 from the fifth arrondissement, Tehran. That's an interesting translation choice to say arrondissement <laughs> rather than uh, something uh, uh, more familiar to an English reader. Uh, it, there's nothing French at all about the original. So th that is an interesting choice. Now I am all set. The bosom of motherland, the lullaby of old civilization and nipple of history and the rat, rat, rattle of walls, rattle box. It is all mine. I am all provided for. In ecstasy, I stand by the window and inhale 678 lungfuls of air scented with dung, urine, and rubbish. I sign my name on 678 bills and on 678 application blanks. Thorofarach Zod. Now, Cholet's translation, which in this case, I will say at the outset, I prefer. <laughs> Victory, got myself registered, decorated an ID card with my name and face and my existence took on a number. So long live number 678, precinct five Tehran. It's a better choice there. Precincts, much better to my mind. No more worries, now I can relax in my motherland's bosom, suckle on our past glory, lulled by lullabies of progress and culture and the jingle jangle of the law's rattle. Ah, yes, no more worries. In excitement, I go to the window, breathe in 678 lungs full of air, smelling of shit, garbage, and piss, and under 678 IOUs and job applications, I sign my name. So, we can see there's definitely a difference in the two translations here. Uh, I think at this point, I'm gonna stop my screen share in case other folks would like to join in, then we can uh, see you as well. Oh, Emily is here, hi. <laughs> um, so feel free please to jump in uh, and move me around the poem if you like. Otherwise, I'm going to just progress slowly through certain things I notice in these early stanzas. Um, and uh, shout out to me if I'm reading and not paying attention, I miss. Uh, but Levi, I wanted, I, yeah. I wanted to say something about the relevance of um, Furuk's poetry. And you know, this work specifically uh, made me think of something I have learned since the new, the new wave of protests have started, that there are still people in um, Iranian born uh, in uh, Sistan and Baluchistan who are not able to get an ID card. And without that, they don't have access to much of anything. And not to mention, we should mention uh, all the Afghanis, the yeah. Afghans uh, who are in, in Iran, um, who even like, they, their families have lived there for generations, still don't have national identity. Right, and and nor are they even able to apply for and get right. such an ID. Yeah. Unlike Farouk Zad, who comes from a pretty solidly middle-class family, this was an easy thing to do. Probably this is, uh, I mean, we were talking about a poem, it's a poetic persona, but Farouk Zad probably did this <laughs> herself at some point. Um, and uh, this, it, it wasn't something new even then. I, I was looking this up before the session today. I, I think I saw that the ID card law went into effect sometime just after Reza Shah took power, mm -hmm. like 1924. So this is nothing new. Here we are almost a hundred years later and still we have people that have the exact same problem. Uh, uneven modernization right? <laughs> that, that treats people differently. Uh, according to social class and, and so on. So thank you, Shireen. And please, anyone else, feel free to do as Shireen did and stop me. <laughs> right, if you want to raise your hands, I'll keep an eye on. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I appreciate uh, yeah. that. I'll, yeah. I'll bring the participant list there. So I'll hopefully see them too. Um, maybe, 
if I have two or three more minutes, we'll look at this next uh, stanza in the poem because there's a few things in here that I think are really cool. Um, that show how Farouk Zod messes with the poetic tradition a little bit. Um, so I'll read in English and then try to explain what we find in the Persian too. Uh, so right after she signs her name, and this is Shole Wolpe's translation again. What a blessing to live in the land of poetry, roses and nightingales. When one's existence is at last noted, a land where from behind the curtains, my first registered glimpse spies 678 poets, scoundrels who in the guise of eccentric bums scrounge about trash bins for words and rhymes. A land where the sound of my first official footsteps rouses into lazy flight from dark swamps and into the edge of day, 678 mystic nightingales who for sheer fun have transformed into old crows. A land where my first official breath mingles with the smell of 678 roses manufactured in the Grand Plasco plastic factory. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, the, I guess I, I'll go for the end to the beginning here. The roses, this is Gulisor, uh, which the film we watched a clip from is named. Uh, the Gulisor shows up throughout Farah Saad's poetry. There is a poem titled that, which I think it's pretty clear the title of that film is taken from Farah Zad's poem, uh, poem title, not uh, where it shows up here. Um, moving up a couple more lines, we see Mystic Nightingale, 678 of them, transforming into Kalor, old crows. And this is another indication of how expert Farouk is at engaging the modernist tradition where the crow shows up throughout, uh, no matter what language you're looking at. Um, and what is she saying here? She's saying that the bulbul, the nightingale, is transforming into the what we traditionally associate with an ugly looking black bird. So she's indicating the transformation within the poetic tradition in this transformation of one bird into another, a bird, who we also find at the beginning of this section in the line, what a blessing to live in the land of poetry, shir, there, that's the Persian word for poetry, shir, roses and nightingales, gulu bulbul. I'll write that here for us because this is a lovely little thing about Persian. So gulu bulbul uh, means roses and nightingales. This is a reference, those of you that know about it, the history of Persian poetry, of course, are familiar with this. This is a reference to a traditional trope within uh, the Ghazal love poem tradition, where you have the flower and the nightingale that are, are representative of the lover and the beloved. And this is also a genre type within the Ghazal tradition that modern poets have challenged in a lot of different national contexts. I have a colleague named Samuel Hodgkin at Yale who is, he's written a few articles about how modern poets come up against this idea of Bolo Bol Bol and they attempt to transform it or forget about it, leave it aside, they see it as um, a representation of, uh, uh, this is the, the poets themselves uh, in their criticism, a representation of an effeminate approach to life that the pre-modern poets were willing to engage, that they wanna do away with, with a new idea of a modern masculine poet that doesn't deal with love themes in the same way. Uh, Farouk Zad, is using the terms here in kind of the same way. She is associating gul bol bol with these old traditions, something that's old and this new poetry is coming in to replace it, trying to forget about the tradition uh, in many ways. We also see here uh, one of many jabs at poets contemporary to Farouk Zad, 
uh, a couple lines later. My first registered glimpse spies 678 poets, scoundrels who in the guise of eccentric bums scrounge about trash bins for words and rhymes. And uh, in the original Persian, it's not uh, words and rhymes, but rather vazn ghafiye. Vazn ghafiye is this. actually means uh, meter and rhyme. So Furur, in both the form and the content of this poem, is challenging the poetic tradition. And it's obviously much more clear when you look at it in the Persian, but I think Sholay does a pretty good job of getting this across as well. Uh, the rose and, Roses and Nightingales are nicely done. In the alternative translation from Pahlavi University, we find in the land of the Rosin Nightingale. He's done a little contraction of and, which actually maybe gets across the sound of bul 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 a little bit better because the vav between the two, which means and, uh, the connector there, because of poetic convention, you have to say it with the L of gul. So it's gul bol bol. You don't say gul va bol bol. That's just bad recitation, right? So this translator, I uh, forgot his name, Masoud Farzan. Yeah. Uh, he's indicating that he knows what you're supposed to say in Persian in the English. But what does it end up doing in the English? It makes it seem really old style, like Rose and Nightingale. We don't even in the 1970s, probably no one's writing English poetry that sounds much like that, right? Um, so I have really, I have talked quite a bit. Uh, I could go on, but maybe now we're at the last half hour. Uh, if we want to look at things more broadly, our folks have questions or other parts of the poem that maybe we want to talk about. I, I think maybe let me be quiet for a second and, and see if anyone would like to intervene here. And in the meantime, I'm going to look ahead and see what else I wanted to talk about in the fall. This is so good. I'm really loving learning literature. Uh, it, once again, you know, studying it with you um, in this context. I do want to like point to, okay, to put Furu in context, like in modern day context like how old she would be um yoko ono just turned 90. Furuk was two years younger than yoko ono but i mean if you think about her like 80 years ago in iran she was writing about female feminine stuff and she was uh not taken so seriously because of it like when you mentioned the golo bol bol and like the uh, modernist poets and their criticism of like the old ghazals being too feminine like what's wrong with that like <laughs> uh, I was reading um, an interview with Mehdi Akhavan Salas who is you know from back you know soon after Furuk had died about Furuk and it just the way and he's a, he was a supporter of her he was like laudatory about her poetry but he was talking about how when she started writing about politics that's when like you know at least some political social themes um broader themes that's when she really like became came into herself um so i wonder you know the kind of misogyny <laughs> that she had to battle you know like to keep her voice, to keep her own voice as she grew, because you grow, obviously, but how do you stay true to yourself in that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I, it's because we have Michael Hillman with us, I, I think you've covered this so well in your biography of Furu, all the uh, trouble that she faced from the critical community within Iran in the reception of her poetry. Uh, really throughout her career, it didn't really matter after the turn to, let's say, quote unquote, more political poetry. It was very much the same, just on the basis of the fact that she was a woman entering into a uh, masculine space, uh, 
which was a poetic production within modern Iran, right? Um, yeah, I saw a hand up. Uh, it was Monica. Oh, it was Monica. Yeah. Actually, Shirin, I kind of just wanted to comment on what you're saying. And it's it's kind of, it's unfortunate, but it's also kind of unusual because we see like our, I don't know, I get not unusual, but it's truly misogynistic, right? Because we see poets like Mahmoud Darwish, who began as this powerful um, political poet, and then his, you know, in his latest or in his in his latest um, collections, like they are love poems, and they are lauded and celebrated for this tenderness and for this connection to emotion and. Um, very intimate personal um, personal subject matter. And yet when it went the other way, right? Starting from this emotional and, and intimate place and moving out into the public square, right? You have a woman who is highly criticized. So, you know, like obviously we see these, we see these, you know, internal conflict or we see these um, social conflicts. Thanks a lot for that. Uh Monica, Monica, yeah, I, that that is a great um, comparative point because things move in the opposite direction with Mahmoud Darwish. As he becomes more introspective, uh, he only gains more favor from the critics, right? <laughs> Even though he's he's moving into what so to be dismissed as oh, this is uh, too introspective. It's just about the individual experience. He's lost the political bent of it. Although, I mean, that's maybe a simplistic reading of later Darwish, but absolutely, I, I'm glad you bring that up. Um, something else that you mentioned, and it reminds me of something that I wanted to say today and I didn't know where I'd fit it in. You talked about the move from an intimate personal space, which we certainly find in Farouzad's early poetry to that of the public square where you have the uh, a poetic persona that's involved in daily life uh, out in the street. Um, sometimes too, we might even say, I, I like to say that by the end of her career, Farouzad was taking on the voice, that, uh, a voice that's much more prophetic, which is a, a term that the critics when applying it to poets, reserve for men almost always. The men are able to take on that prophetic voice, but what are women limited to? Oh, talking about love relationships within the home, very personal individual experience that doesn't apply beyond them, right? But with Farouzad, this isn't the case. I think she does take on that prophetic voice by engaging the, the broader modernist tradition, especially in the last collection. It's really clear to me that she does this. And I think one thing that helps her do this is by occupying a space that I I'm, have suggested in what I wrote, and I think some other folks agree with me in some recent work that's coming out soon, that Farah Zad is very much a modern female version of Baudelaire's, Charles Baudelaire's flaneur. So she's a flaneuse figure who is a witness to what happens in public, but not necessarily always a participant within it. And the move from the intimate space of the home into the street is one that we can trace through her poetry and then also within single poems. So let us believe in the beginning of the cold season moves back and forth between those two spaces. And I think that it is really productive to use that somewhat tired trope of the flaneur uh, as read through the work of Walter Benjamin and apply it to the case of Farouk Farouk Zod within Tehran, because there's something there. I, I think we can get a lot out of that. Um, so I, I thank you, Monica. You gave me a chance to say this. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't see other hands and I don't believe I, I saw any in the meantime. So uh, maybe I'll go now to a couple other moments in the poem. 
Yeah, if we go to the part about Hachik's back room, this is page 146 of Cholet's translation. There's something interesting here in the Persian that unfortunately doesn't come across. Um, actually, I, Shireen, can what I call part you? is it? Can I call on you again to read? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. part are we looking uh, at? So it is several stanzas in towards the end. It's actually kind of in the middle. It'll take us a second to find it, but uh, it is man mitavanam as fardam. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. If you could read that through to the Ashnui Asle Vige, that last line there with the cigarettes. I, um, there's something. Okay, so the stop page. me if I miss it. Just sure, yeah. say cut. Okay. Gosh, I haven't practiced this. I'm sorry, it's a pretty honest <laughs> <one>. <laughs> So I, I'm going to have Kalakulut. <laughs> من می توانم از فردا همچون وطن پرست قیوری سهمی از ایدئال عظیمی که اجتماع هر چهارشنبه بعد از ظهر I'll be back soon. I'm sorry. There's no? so many so many from tomorrow on. Sorry. در کوچه های شهر؟ نه در پوستی مغازه خاچیک. Okay, is it before or after? Uh, I found it, found it, found okay. it. Okay, uh -huh. yeah. All right. Man mi tawanam az farda dar pastu, pastu ye maghazeh khachik, bada az furu kishidan chandin nafas, ze chand gram jens dast awal khalis, va sarf chand badiye pepsi kolay na khalis, na khalis, va pakhsh chand ya... Hag va yo. Ya hag. Ya hag. Ya hag va pakhsh chand. Ya hag va ya ho va 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 ho ho ho. Rasman be majma'e fazay fukur va fazlahay fazl roshan fikr va peyrovan maktab dakh dakh tarakh tarakh be peyvandam. Va tarh avalin roman bozorgam ra که در حوالی سنه 1678 شمسی تبریزی رسما به زیر دستگاه توهی دست چپ خواهد رفت بر هر دو پشت 678 پاکت اشنوی اصل ویژه بریزم آره به به مرسی I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> Just where... Okay it's only been 40 Four years since I left it on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but why did we need to hear this in Persian? It's because, uh, it, well, let me read it in English and then I'll mention it. From tomorrow on, this is the uh, last stanza on page 146 in the Wolpe translation. From tomorrow on, I can snort a few grams of a first rate product in the Hachik's back room, consume a few glasses of impure Pepsi. And after a few, Ya Allah, Hallelujah, Woof Woof, and Moo Moos, officially join the ranks of high minded literati. Intelligentsia is cream of the crop, and the followers of the Umpa Umpa school. And my first masterpiece novel will be officially printed by a bankrupt press sometime in the Tabrizi solar year 1678. The plot noted on both sides of 678 packets of genuine quality Ashnu cigarettes. And yeah, we'll stop there. So uh, in the Persian, where we've got uh, this, the persona moving into the back, Khachik's back room, if you didn't read the note, this is a very Armenian name. So an Armenian would be someone who is uh, able to operate a shop where you sell booze, basically. <laughs> so it would be available there. Uh, but not only that, I, I think we're also talking about heroin here. Um, so the, the drug use stuff is there in the content, but then also in the Persian, the lines about this end in Chand Garame Jen Sedas de Avale Khalis. And the next line ends in Pepsi Kola Na Khalis. So we have Khalis there twice uh, as a as really long rhyme linking the two things together and 
this is what I wanted to get to finally. We have the Pepsi coli in uh, Isafe construction there, where we see, and I find this in Arabic too, uh, people who were writing during the 20th century, we see the, reforming or perhaps deforming of the language itself by these foreign words. So Pepsi Cola, this is not something version, obviously. It's American multinationalism. We see the effects of globalization in the poem itself. Actually, a number of times. We have the plastic factory as well. We've got, well, the cigarette brand is local, but there are other spots too where you see these transliterated English words coming into the Persian language and really like shaping it in strange ways. This week, I'm reading a novel with my students uh, in a class focused on modern Egypt, We're reading a novel called Alejna, the Committee by Sonala Ibrahim, in which the narrator, uh, who is the main character in the, the book, um, is really obsessed with advertising in modern Egypt and how it has shaped even the way people interact with each other and how their brains work. So I think Farouk, in what she does in lines like this, is sh she's showing how capitalism <laughs> is changing literature, literally. It's changing the language and how it works. And the place of empire, American imperialism, all of this, it's really front and center here. This is a completely different approach to the West than we find from say the Shah and his hangers on who operate in an entirely different way uh, when they're looking westward. Um, Farul, she, she's really challenging it by uh, what she does in, in the poetry. Um, and then of course, I mean, the, there's the very obvious uh, uh, sort of uh, making fun of uh, contemporary intelligentsia and literati in Iran and talking about how everything they do is BS, <laughs> basically. And this is a response to her critics, too. Karen, I see your hand. Hi. Um, sorry if you maybe said something about this when I had to step out for a minute, but since you since you were talking about the language, because obviously reading the translation, that's something that stands out is the these words that are sort of speak to globalization or capitalist culture or whatever. I was just wondering, and I'm, I mean, I'm coming, you know, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of the work that I do with Hebrew uh, literature and the way that the language is sort of enmeshed in, all, in sort of ideological projects and so on, um, modern Hebrew, um, and that the way that we see that in poetry and in literature. And I wondered if, if maybe you could say something about I mean, you mentioned how she, what she's doing in this poem as a kind of, you know, bringing in these terms as at least partly a kind of a different approach to this kind of encounter with the West or with Western culture. And I wonder if you could say something about Persian, the language sort of more generally, and if there is a tradition of poets engaged in this kind of resistance through language or political statements through language or anything like that, um, how does how do poets in general, and, and I'm also, if you know, and I don't know, you know, I don't want to sort of take us too far afield, but since this, you know, we're talking about poetry of conflict and transformation, and given everything that's happening in Iran today, if that's something, if there's some subversive way that poets are using language in today's political context. Yeah, uh, good question. I, there's, there's a super long history of this that I, I could take us really off course and go to Ferdowsi and the Shah Mameh where he's supposed to have tried to purge Persian of Arabic influence. This is back in the 10th century, <laughs> it's a thousand years ago. But, but there's a political aspect to that too, right? Because you're trying to do a celebration of Persian culture for political reasons as well. He's writing this for a sultan who wants to make money and being bringing Persian back to life is what he's said to have done with this. Um, as far as contemporary works where we find stuff like that going on. Uh, there is, uh, there's a lot of different ways uh, we could look at, at what happens here. Um, there's a recent book by Fatima Shams, who is a professor of Persian literature at the University of Pennsylvania called, 
and co-optation, poets and the poetics of co-optation in the Islamic Republic or something like that uh, with Oxford. And in that book, she looks at poets who attempt to affiliate themselves with the Islamic Republic, with the ruling regime, with the Ayatollah and uh, his followers, the Mullahs, um, uh, from 1980 until today. And how do they do so? By returning to classical forms like the longer Qasida Od that we're used to from Arabic, uh, pre-modern Persian, uh, and using it in traditional modes like praise modes, praise poetry, things like that for the regime, for leaders in the regime, et cetera. Um, that's the opposite of what you're asking. <laughs> I, but it is definitely related, right? And yeah, yeah, surely. Because on the other hand, um, and looking, if we look at very contemporary Iran, um, you see among young folks uh, and this goes back to the advent of social media, which is right before 2009 and the Green Revolution, like rappers becoming socially involved um, the same way that maybe the 19, 1980s hip hop in the US was, uh, like public enemy, things like that. Uh, I, ideas of social change coming up in the music and the lyrics um, and, I don't research this, so I don't, I can't say this with any like backing, but I, it, well, let me just say it would be interesting to see if any contemporary rappers rapping in Persian engage in any way Persian poetic forms. And what I mean by that is like traditional meters, or do they do anything cool with that? Or is it all just we've done away with that and we're adopting American <laughs> approaches where uh, in all honesty, the sound of the rap, if that is the case, would be closer to what we supposedly would have found in middle Persian prosodic uh, uh, forms. Why? Because Persian like- Quality, it, right? Is Indo-European. It is, yes, a qualitative, meter in in Pahlavi, uh, so middle Persian Persian, it doesn't become quantitative until the contact with the Arabs and then they apply this prosodic system that makes no sense for Persian to Persian. And then you have to get around that and all these things which are very difficult to do. And uh, that's like what I spend my time working on. It's very yeah. weird and hard to deal with because it doesn't make any sense. And uh, trying to figure out how meter worked over that thousand year period gets very difficult to do. Um, so I don't have an answer for you, but I, I have directions that we could look. But I think that would be pretty cool to know about. Um, and I, I'm not the person to do it because I, I just don't, I'm not familiar enough with what people actually are doing there. Uh, but from what I can tell, from what I have heard, there's definitely a return to a qualitative type of metrics like you find in American rap. Um, and it works well, because that's what Persian is supposed to be like. <laughs> it's not supposed to be analyzed like the way we do English poetry with Greek terminology. <laughs> it just doesn't function at all, right? No, I have a, I have yeah, a very uh, uh, naive question, question from the perspective of someone who is naive to the, you know, scholarly study of literature. Uh, I wonder, like, okay, so in Iran, most people write poetry, or at least they, they call, we call it poetry. But as I was thinking about, like, Karen's questions, like, there is poetry everywhere. <laughs> it's like, it's on the walls, it's in Baraye, it's like, but then I realized that may not count officially as poetry. So what makes something I write, or, you know, like when I went to Iran, arrived late at night, the airport, went to my aunt's house and my Amajunta had a, like on the spot, um, made up a poem about, you know, 
my return and that was a poem like was that a poem yes <laughs> <laughs> i'll say yes yes i i mean uh, how do we define poetry is the the definition i'm most familiar with goes back to the Greeks and then was adopted by the Arabs. And they say that um, um, the translation of that is poetry is rhymed and metered speech that has meaning. Okay. Is this satisfying for us today? It cannot be because we have the phenomenon of the prose poem. Uh, mm -hmm. which does not have rhyme and meter. Well, it doesn't necessarily have rhyme or meter. Mm -hmm. It might, but it doesn't have to have rhyme and meter. Bye, Karen. Um, so uh, today, your question is excellent because I don't think we can answer it. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we've gotten to the point where we have things that people, critics, call poetry that don't fit those old definitions. So what can, what do we do uh, with something that the author of calls a poem, but doesn't have any semblance of what we know as poetry? And that's a rhetorical question. I don't know <laughs> what we do with that. <laughs> All right, thank you. I feel okay. better. Yeah, I feel better not knowing. I don't have a better answer. <laughs> no, but other than, other than uh, I mean, if, if, if they call it poetry, and I, I suppose if anyone else accepts that it's poetry, then it's poetry. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we, we find these poetic aspects in everything. Uh, the current movement, Zen, Zen, Degi, Azadi. Mm -hmm. Consonance is there. It's poetry. You have the Zay that's bringing everything together zan zandagi look at that i mean it's a, a part of the word that then shows up in in the second word um it has a nice rhythm to it as well uh a lot of the chants that i have heard not that i have any coming to mind that i can just repeat right now uh, from the current movement they are informed by poetry uh the same thing happened in the arab spring when i was there in cairo and the people start shouting a shab, you read a skat and nizam, you have a beat to it that uh, doesn't go along with any of the arud prosodic sciences that the Arabs use to define things as poetry. But what does it have? It has uh, stress, mm -hmm. like English poetry would, um, which is, is not a defining feature of Arabic poetry, but it's poetic still. We can, we can understand it as poetry, right? Thank you. Yeah. I hear my cat, everyone. If you hear yowling, it's the cat. <laughs> so we have a couple of minutes. Are there any questions or comments? I do have a final slide I could share. <laughs> I have this. And you know what, uh, Shireen, if, if folks want, I, I can, I, I think I did send this slideshow out. Um, you can share it with participants. Okay, if, is it the same version you yeah, sent? Yeah, it's the same. I, I, okay. It's a spacing issue. That's nothing. It's fine. Okay. Um, if uh, anyone's interested in more info about Farah Zawad, I've put the title of Sholay's translation, which is a collection of poems from across Farah Zawad's career. It's not all of them. Uh, it's Sin 2007. The BBC Forum episode I was on with Chole and uh, Jasmine Darzni uh, about Farah Zad is at this link, um, which if you get this PowerPoint, you can just click on it and get there. And then I'm not suggesting anyone go buy my book, but if you have access through your library, go through Cambridge Core. Uh, it's way too expensive to have for a personal library, a hundred bucks. <laughs> Hopefully a paperback will come out in the future. But chapter six in the book uh, will give you my take on Farouk Zad's last poem, which I think is her best poem uh, that was eventually published in 1974. And I, I give a very long and detailed reading of that poem there. Okay, cool. All right, thank you.
thanks to you and to everyone for coming. I, I appreciate having this chance to talk with everybody. Everyone, thank you for showing up today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed some poetry and it's uh, stimulating your need for more poetry in your life. It, it does for me. Yeah. Likewise, me too. Have a great afternoon. Let me see if there are any last. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Leila, for reminding me. Please don't leave. We have something cool happening tomorrow. Um, we have uh, an, another installation of our recurring series this year called Community and Conversation. Um, Leila, do you want to say a little bit about it? I can. I can. Um, oops. oops. I forgot where I need to be unmuting myself today. Um, yes, so thanks everyone for sticking around. Uh, we're having this series um, called Community and Tea. Um, it sort of has emerged out of uh, a need we felt um, within our community to have some psychosocial support around um, everything that's happening in Iran with the protests. Um, and the news that's reaching us over here about what's happening in Iran today. Um, and tomorrow our gathering is gonna feature an Iranian poet um, named Roja Chamankar. And she is going to conduct a, a reading and poetry workshop for those in attendance. Um, I am going to be, I did drop a link to our event page where you can find out more information. Um, it will be taking place tomorrow at 5.30, um, from 5.30 to seven um, at the ACC Highland campus. Um, I'm also gonna drop the address in the chat, um, although that is featured on the event page too. Um, so if, if any of you all would like to come, whether you're Iranian or not, you're welcome. Um, and we'd love to see you there. No, so you don't have to be an ACC affiliated person to come. Right. It's open to the community and there is tea from um, Monkey Nest served and baklava and um, other sweets. And um, the poem poems will be in uh, accessible to, it, they'll be in English and maybe some Persian too, but available, but yeah. So, thank you, have a great, rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.